to the point with Congressman Bill Pascrell, focusing on the concerns and issues facing the families of New Jersey's 9th Congressional District. Hi there, I'm uh, Congressman Bill Pascrell from the great state of New Jersey, District Number 9. Welcome to our interview program, To the Point. I want to apologize for the inconsistencies due to me and the Congress uh, over the last year or so. So uh, very important that we stay on, and uh, your letters are very important and significant now that we've expanded. Uh, welcome to our interview program, uh, which is to the point. Uh, today we have with us, we're lucky to have with us, Hunter College Professor Benjamin Carter Heft, one of our leading scholars on the rise of fascism. I don't want to scare anybody today, but you heard me talk about this 10 years ago. Uh, you've, read, you've written several gripping books about the rise of dictatorships, autocracies, lessons for us today. We're going to talk about the parallels between what happened in the 1930s in Europe which people said can't happen, and threats to American democracy today can't happen. I mean, I was there in the middle of that on January the 6th of last year, and I couldn't believe it. I thought this was a fantasy. A, you know, I fell asleep on the floor or something, and I'm dreaming this or something. But I want to welcome you to the, to the point, Dr. Heff, and thank you, Professor, for being with us today. Well, thank you, Congressman. It's an honor to be with you. It's a critical issue. It has a lot to do with our politics. And people are going to say, what are they talking about that? I mean, I'm paying X amount of money for a bottle of milk and a gallon of gasoline. It's what you should be talking about. And we have been talking about and having, having to try to do something about it, the right thing to do, so we don't make matters worse. I was just showing the doctor before uh, I'm a... And a 2011 calendar, we send our calendars every year to Congress. Uh, and this was, a, 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 the inside story was about the insurrection. <laughs> uh, the attack on the Capitol in 1861. Did you know that? Now, if you didn't know that, you don't know American history. That's not good. Because this has happened before not just in the capital of the United States, but it's happened all over the world. Now, we've been on a hiatus because of the pandemic, but we are back with a great show. The fascists did not go on vacation. Uh, so we have Hunter College Professor Benjamin Carter Head, one of our leading scholars on the rise of fascism. He's written several gripping books. Here's one of them, The Death of Democracy. So you've probably been called an alarmist, mm -hmm. but that's the price of it, what you're, you're paying for speaking out. We're going to talk about the parallels between what happened in the 30s in Europe and the threats to American democracy today. So I welcome you, and thank you, Professor, for taking the time to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure and it's an honor, sir. Professor Hatt. You've studied and written extensively about the rise of fascism in Europe in the 20s and 30s. What specific parallels do you see in what happened then, and which are pretty basic in, 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 as we see and develop a definition of what fascism is? Mm -hmm. What do you see in the parallels yourself? So that's a really great question, and it's a really important question. And it's also a question that is uh, not easy to answer, but I'm happy to give it a crack. Well, that's why we're so, here. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, I specialize in Germany in particular, so that's certainly the case I yeah. know best. Um, and the way I would put it is there are parallels that we should be worried about. And certainly I have been called an alarmist for that, for saying that. Yeah, that's um, an easy one. <laughs> yeah, I, I would rather be called an alarmist than be called complacent. And I think the more we are alarmed, the more we will be ready to defend ourselves uh, from the threat of fascism or something very close to it. You could call it super nationalist authoritarianism, whatever. Yeah, what's, but, what do you see specifically as super nationalism? 
okay. America first. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, basically. Uh, you know, I, I mean, again, that's something that one could go on forever about. But I, I think that one lesson that we as sort of as Americans and, and really as kind of the global community, one lesson we learned coming out of World War II and with some of the steps that were taken after, like the creation of NATO, the development of the Marshall Plan, um, the development of the United Nations, is that national ties work. They work politically. Um, they work politically to foster democracy and to prevent war, and they work economically. The arrangements that the United States basically championed after World War II created a really peaceful and prosperous world in the sort of zone of American influence. And sadly, we seem to be running away from that lesson now, back to an attitude that caused a lot of problems in the 1930s, back to isolationism, back to America first, back to all those kinds of attitudes that were really prevalent um, in the aftermath of the First World War in America. And that's not a way to deal with global problems. It's not a way to deal with national problems. It's not a way to deal with economic or political problems. But I fear we're getting to a point where the, the kind of collective memory of World War II and the Depression is now fading to an extent that we're really getting close to making it, once again, the kinds of mistakes um, that we made really in the 1920s and 1930s and kind of pulling back from the world. Why is that? What, what do you think caused this? Well, I think there's a few factors, and actually, in a way, this then comes back to your earlier question about parallels back to the 1930s. Um, one parallel that strikes me, if I look at Germany in the 1920s and 30s, my particular specialty, and America today, right. is that um, I've argued, I argue in that book, that the issue that really gave the Nazis political traction and helped them to succeed in elections when they were still free right. elections is not an issue that a lot of people would think of first. It wasn't anti-Semitism, it wasn't glorification of war, it was a nationalist reaction against globalization. That's the thing that really gave them electoral traction. People from other countries coming my way. Uh, people from other countries, and especially economic forces from other countries, uh, trade flows, um, uh, flows of capital and you know uh, loans and so on. Uh, the whole structure of the financial system in the 20s for Germany was sort of geared around paying reparations and this became super complicated. American banks loaned um, German governments at all levels money basically so that the German governments could pay reparations to uh, France or Britain or Belgium. And this kind of went in a huge transatlantic financial cycle with all kinds of spin-offs of um, you know, refinancing arrangements and banks and debt obligations and so on. And all of this was something the German nationalists really intensely resented and the Nazis were able to capitalize on that. Yeah. And it reminds me of maybe eight, ten years ago when I started to hear that these people from other places are taking our jobs. Mm -hmm. And when one examined the data, that was not true. In fact, they were helping the economy. Immigrants are good. Right. Like my mother and father or my grandmother and grandfather came here with the clothes on their back. Right. Why should we resent these people? We will resent them if people are putting thoughts in our mind that these guys are stealing from you. Uh, that's exactly right. And in fact, that was a real issue in Germany in the 20s and 30s, too, in exactly that form. Um, uh, one of the issues in German politics in the time before the Nazis got in power was security of the eastern border, which was a, a new border with Poland because right. the nation of Poland had just been created. And Germany didn't have the police or military manpower to really control that border. And because of things like the Russian Revolution further east, there was a massive refugee flow um, coming you know, and westwards into it. Germany. And, and you know, hundreds of thousands of people fled the Russian Revolution. Yeah. Of those hundreds of thousands, uh, about 80,000 maybe were Jewish. And, and that really crystallized a particularly vicious kind of anti-Semitism among the German uh, right-wing political activists who were saying the kinds of things you're talking about. You know, right. You know, these Jews are coming in and they're exploiting us and, you know, and so on and, and so on and so on. Last week, the Justice Department filed its first sedition charges against the Oath Keepers. Ho, ho. They mentioned the name, sed the word sedition. And we have an amendment, 14th Amendment, which is very specific, isn't it? Mm -hmm. About what does it mean to try to overthrow the government? You don't have to have a cannon on the lawn of the Capitol. So talk about your opinion of what happened on January 6th. And is this, social, is this the pathway to fascism? I think yes and no is the answer because I think you're exactly right that um, sedition or insurrection doesn't necessarily require a cannon in front of the Capitol. And in fact, the more really dangerous kind very definitely does not require that. And right. to me, um, I actually I wrote a, an op-ed about this that was in the LA Times just after January 6th. And basically my point was, I'm less worried, in a sense, about 
the thugs who ran into the Capitol. I mean, actually, I mean, I'd be worried for you. I mean, I'm worried for the safety of the I folks was here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, down, downplay Pattinson, that. And I'm from Madison, New Jersey, but I was worried. <laughs> yeah, you know, but in terms of overturning the state, like even if January 6th had gone worse, the state would still, I mean, our state, our government would still be there. But what's dangerous is when those folks are inside the system so yeah. they don't have to use violence. So to me, the really worrying thing is the way the Republicans have completely refused to condemn this. They've, they've sort of both kind of adopted it and run away with it. And just as you know better than I, they don't want to talk about it. Um, but, you know, large numbers of your colleagues in the House voted to say that the uh, election was not legitimate. You know, and uh, they're not playing along with the committee right. uh, that is investigating January 6th. It's just stonewalling everything. And the prospect of what could happen when they have, you know, legislative power and, you know, God forbid, presidential power soon again, um, that's frightening. When, when those people with that attitude and that refusal to condemn and indeed, it seems, acceptance of what was happened on January 6th. See, that's a, to me, that's an insurrection that is dangerous. I mean, that's in fact the Hitler playbook, basically, to sort of get I'm inside not, I'm the not system. misreading the Constitution, am I? Uh, well, I'm not an expert on the Constitution, but as far as I know, not, yeah. So the person who is the leader is the person that's most familiar with what's going on in, 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 in those folks that are casting doubt on whether the government should exist and continue as it is. So like, he's my friend, he's my buddy, he understands me, he understands my desires. And it's inside, mm -hmm. it's not coming from another government, although that possibility still exists. Indeed. Because I'm not convinced that the former president didn't have, didn't have, wasn't part of a cabal with the, Mr. Putin and the Russians. I'm not convinced of that at all. I'm not convinced either. There seems to be evidence, plenty of evidence for that. Yeah. And time is a factor of trying to find out what in God's name did happen. Yep. What commitments did you make? How come you never criticized one of our great adversaries? Uh, what, well, makes you feel good? Or did you try to make a deal for something? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I can't. I can't say this is the case, but there's got to be a reason. There's got to be a reason. Uh, in, your, in your great book, The Death of Democracy, the one I held up before, you wrote millions of Germans retreated into conspiracy, into conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. we, we can spot them now. Yeah. And that so many supported fascists because of a rejection of rational a rational, factual world. Let's reject that. Uh, can you explain what you mean? What did you mean here? And do you see the same rejection of a rational, factional world here in America today? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, you know, I wrote that long before January 6th. But, um, you know, there's a precise parallel uh, to what we're now talking about is the big lie uh, in, the, in German history in the 20s and 30s. And the, the precise parallel is... Uh, there was a lie that was deliberately uh, fostered after the end of World War I by uh, the military high command of the German army. The lie being the German army hadn't really lost the First World War. So if, even there, yeah. there's this sort of odd Don't believe parallel. What they tell you. Yeah, you know, the fact that <laughs> we, we surrendered. The, the fact that we surrendered, you know. But the, the, the gist of the story was that uh, they claimed that as their army was on the very point of victory over Britain and France and America and so on. Um, they were stabbed in the back by various villains as they cast it at home. And the villains basically were um, Democratic uh, center-left politicians or left politicians, and very particularly Jews as well. There was a real anti-Semitic element yeah. to the stab in the back theory. The, the little grain of truth in all this is that there was a peaceful revolution, more or less peaceful revolution in Germany just as World War I was ending, and the previous uh, monarchical regime was replaced by a new democratic republic. Um, but that uh, followed rather than preceded the making of the armistice that ended the uh, fighting. And, I mean, the stab in the back was completely false, plus the fact that no historian is in any doubt about the fact that the German army was very squarely militarily defeated, uh, and its commanders knew that. Uh, but what, may, what was Hitler's real secret? I mean, I read the Mein Kampf, and I read all the stuff you should read about what happened between the wars. But what made Hitler so convincing... And I'll tell you, we'll get, we'll get our, our whatever's coming to us, the good things that are coming, and we didn't lose the war, and we need to go back and finish the job. Mm. 
Well, I think part of it is it's what a lot of people wanted to believe. You know, the, 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 the German version of the big lie was something that was avidly believed by, you know, maybe roughly half or so of the population, generally the more right-wing half. Um, it was sort of psychologically necessary to believe that, I think. And Hitler capitalized on that, which also reflects, you know, to your question, and this is something I think we don't always really want to acknowledge, but there were things that Hitler was really, really good at. He was a very clever person in some ways, and one of his amazing But a beast, personal nonetheless. Without question. Um, but, you know, there's, there's no point in saying he was a beast, and he had no abilities, which some historians actually more or less say that. But he actually was extremely good at reading people. He was extremely good at reading uh, individual people one-on-one, -on -one, and he was extremely right. good at sort of reading the mood of a crowd. And he could sort of, he, it's, one of his colleagues actually said he had a kind of radar for people. He could sort of sense what they wanted to hear, and then he could say it to them. So he had the real skill of being able to, you know, sort of be all things to all people, or at least many things to many people. And that also made him very convincing to a lot of Germans. Well, you know, in the death of democracy, you wrote that the German people seethed with resentments and hatreds and were bitterly divided along every conceivable line. You single out bitterness against people in cities. I just heard one of the governors out west talk about, well, you know, no one wants to live in cities anymore. <laughs> you know who lives there. <laughs> Immigrants, you know. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, mm -hmm. my grandmother. It's hard to hear that and not think of our own divisions yep. in the same way. Yep. And I think you would agree. There was, in uh, again, one of the interesting things about Germany in the 20s and 30s is there was a kind of red state, blue state division, you know, to put it into our yes. terms. There was a real division between uh, rural areas that were generally conservative, generally religiously Protestant, um, and then the big cities, especially Berlin, which was, relatively speaking, in German terms, more diverse, had a different kind of religious mixture. That basically meant right. there were some Catholics and some Jews. Um, and there were all these like reinforcing things. The cities and rural areas had had different experiences in World War I. Um, the way European armies worked in World War I, the rank and file, you know, the grunts were far more likely to be farm boys than city boys. Yeah. So that meant that rural areas had much higher casualties. And they looked at the cities. Which caused the resentment in yeah. itself. Oh yeah, absolutely. They looked at the cities as places where they're all shirkers, because basically people in the cities, kind of by definition, if they're workers, they're, um, they're factory workers who are you know, making the weapons that the soldiers need. So you need those people you know, making the machine guns and the cannons and all that sort of stuff, but then they don't tend to get drafted and sent to the front. The farm boys get drafted and sent to the front. So that's another of the, there are all these sort of mutually reinforcing, you know. So fascists, whether it be in the 30s or 1530, fascists want to take advantage of the weakness within the society to gain power. Yeah. Um, I mean, what are we doing this for? <laughs> Just to point out? You know, something pedantic, something intellectual. No. I'm a professor. That's what I'm all about. <laughs> <laughs> We're not doing it for that reason. Yeah. Uh, right. We're doing it for a very purpose, purposeful objective, yeah. correct? Yeah. And what's the objective? Well, so, the, I mean, ideally, you it's a cliche, but ideally you learn from history how not to make the same mistakes in the future. So, ideally, we learn to recognize fascism so that we don't fall prey to it again. Um, you know, in a way, I would say almost everything I try to do as a teacher and as a writer is sort of about conveying that there are things in the past we don't want to do again. And what conditions in a society are particularly, particularly wholesome for the growth of fascism? Oh, I'll give you one. Maybe I think the most key, a feeling of humiliation on the part of a lot of people. I think humiliation is the most dangerous political feeling. When people feel humiliated, and that was the case for a lot of Germans. It was the case for Germans who felt right. they, you know, they had really won the war and they had been humiliated by the Allies. And then if you're a rural you know, farm person, you're being humiliated by those hoity-toity people in Berlin who think they're better than you are. And, and you know, it piles up, right? We had a perfect so, example of that in the election of 2016. Yeah. I mean, we had a perfect example yeah. of that. Yeah. And when Hillary ran, and I was a big supporter of Hillary Clinton and still am, I think she's a knowledgeable and she could do the job. Mm -hmm. But when she said the malcontents, and the other word that she used, I forget it right now. Deplorables, I Deplorables. think. Deplorables. Yeah. I said, uh-oh. Yeah. And sure enough, and if I was on the other side, I would have taken advantage of it. Because 
because what you're doing is looking down your nose at people, trying to correct one situation and creating another. And 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 that was what festered there, and that and that and that grew. You know, I think in our country we have a situation where for several decades there's all kinds of you know I'm sure you know economic data on this that you know lots of people like working people haven't seen a real rise in standard of living for several decades. And in some ways, their conditions have gotten worse. You yeah. know, if, if they say that someone used to work in an auto factory and is now, you know, got a less well-paid job doing something less skilled, this, yeah. this is happening frequently, this is going to come with a feeling of humiliation. And then if they get the idea, and the Republicans, I think, are pretty good at making their base think this, that basically people like me, you know, a professor who lives in New York City, looks down on folks who live in rural areas, right? Not actually true. I actually grew up in a relatively, I grew up in a Canadian version of a red state, basically. And, you know, uh, but that idea is out there. And so there is a feeling of humiliation. And I think the feeling of humiliation that a lot of people have is, is powerful wind in the sails of, of Trump and everything he represents. Yes, yeah, so we want those, of, those folks, some of them, uh, want immigration, but only those people who have a particular technical skill. Mm -hmm. You other folks, Stay back. We don't need you. We don't want you. And yet, these are where the job openings, many of them are as well. And because we don't have the immigrants to fill many of these jobs, as usually was the case, we're suffering as a to on our total economy. Although, actually, the best economy is before us. The best economy is before us. So, one of history's terrible moments was January the 30th, uh, 1933. Mm -hmm. There were many opportunities to halt the rise of fascism, to stop Hitler in his early stage. What could the German opposition parties have done differently, do you think, at that particular time? We're almost saying, what could folks do today mm -hmm. that see democracy suffering and, and, and the United States prestige slipping? What lessons can Congress learn from inaction and failure in the year of 2022? So I think there's, there's two things. Um, one is, so political parties or politically active individuals or voters, however you want to think about this, who aren't you know, hardcore Trump supporters, need to build a big tent. This is so, 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 so important. It, you know, if there's one thing I feel I could convey from what I know from studying history, it's the one mistake that German anti-Nazis made around 1933 was not joining to stop Hitler. Because not everybody knows this, but um, Hitler and the Nazis, at their very best in a totally free election, got 37% of the vote. Wow. Uh, which is a lot, but obviously it's nowhere near a majority. So all the other parties could have banded together to stop it. And in particular, the kind of center and left parties could have banded together to stop it. They could have stopped it in its tracks. Which is about the basic opposition to the regular Republican and Democratic parties that we saw grow and, yeah. and produced. Yeah, right. What's his name? And, and, <laughs> and, and, and it's pretty fascinating to look at. It is. Uh, and, and there's nothing to say that this is not some kind of an internal pattern. And if we don't address it, it gets worse. We, we have proof in history. It doesn't get better by itself. No. And, and a lot of people suffer. That's absolutely right. But so, when you're doing it, it's like the left who believes that the Democratic Party should be doing these kinds of things. This is what the people want to hear. Not a majority, though. Not a majority. And you got to get people into office in order to establish, and you got to get people into office to change things. Yeah. And if you insist that you have all the answers, you lose. Um, you don't need me. You don't need a professor. You've been doing this a long time. You don't need a professor to tell you this. But I agree with you 100%. You can't worry about being pure. you got to win first. Yeah. Once, once you win... Then you can try and do some of the things you want. But I really worry about some people in the Democratic Party who sort of want to hold their purity. And, and you know, when I see, you know, some of the more left Democrats primering more moderate Democrats, I want to scream because that's, yeah. that's exactly the opposite of what we need to do to stop fascism, which is the absolutely urgent priority right now. Like those Germans who didn't go along <laughs> brought the pure truth. <laughs> you <Yeah>. dopes. <laughs> You creeps are going to bring us to war again. Didn't reach out. Didn't reach out. Now, yeah. is that always possible? Um, I, probably every situation is different, but I, whether it's possible or not, I think it has to be tried. And I, I think, I think 
if we don't recognize that building a big tent is really the way to stop the worst outcomes, we are heading for trouble. And that takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage. It because takes a lot of patience. You, you, you're sending a message that, wait a minute, or, or and the message is coming back, wait a minute, you, you, you feel just as like we do, yeah. and why are you off trying to make friends here? Right. And it's not that I'm oversimplifying, it, of course, but I, I think the results are pretty dangerous. What I, you uh, do is push them off further. Yeah. I heard you say once on, on one of your shows that to be in politics, you have to not be angry all the time, which I think is really important. Yeah. And, and that's part I got to remind myself of that, Professor. <laughs> I got to remind myself of that. Yeah. I think there's good anger and there's destructive anger. Of course. Yes. And you have to remember Hitler was not there re examining and trying to figure out what was the best way to Nirvana for him. Right. He just wanted the power and put one group against another and kept the, the division going. And he also, he also made allies where he needed to with very unlikely people sometimes, Stalin, right? yeah. when it suited him. Uh, so yeah, because you're exactly right. He, he wanted to be in power and win, and he would do whatever needed to be done to get there. But if we would have looked at the extremism in the United States in the first decade of the 21st century, and before that, I mean, in certain states, I mean, the militia was forming. And we're there to protect the truth, really. <laughs> and, and the answer to that is, well, he, we're here to protect the truth, and you're stupid, <laughs> and you don't know the truth. What are we expecting? What are we expecting in the final analysis? One of history's terrible moments, and we've talked about it, was in... 1933, and we hope we learned. What is your advice to Americans uh, out there watching this interview today? <laughs> um, I mean, is Pascarell or wet? Is he talking out of both sides of his mouth? I think, uh, for my money, I think you have you, you have exactly the right take on this. You know, what's my advice to Americans? Register to vote and vote. I also um, I advise people. Uh, maybe this isn't what you want to hear, but I always tell people, call your Congress people, call your senators, call them all the time, let them know what you think. And don't threaten uh, their lives. Right, but, yes. Democrats but, and Republicans are getting threatened like yeah. not, we not, haven't seen this before. Yeah. And if you take those threats innocently and casually, well, what do you expect you're going to show up with? What's going to happen? Uh, I, I've never discussed this publicly before, but the feds know about it. My life was threatened in December of 2020, mm. after the election. Mm. And this, they called my, my wife's phone with a message for me. I answered my wife's phone. She was in the kitchen cooking. And they said some unkind words and then threatened my life. That's They're horrific. They're going to mess up my face. Ugh. I mean, it's messed up enough. But. <laughs> and, and they were serious. I would call, you know, I have a protocol who to call right away, and right. they called me, feds called me right away. The phone had already been disconnected. I could write a, I could write a chapter just on that incident and what it did to my family. Yeah, I can imagine. And it's not pleasant. Mm. And look, no, one's, no one puts a gun to your head to run for office. I know that. But I don't think that should be the price, regardless whether it's left, right, or middle. I mean, we, we live in the greatest democracy in the world, but you have to fight to keep it every day. Right. This is not over at any given time. I do think it's, I, wait, you know, to stick your last point, I think it is important not to be complacent and not to think democracy will just sort of go on by itself without us. It won't. You know, it takes someone like yourself with the courage to run for office and to deal with this kind of stuff, and it takes the rest of us to be engaged in a nonviolent way in the system. I really w wonder about what you just said because it makes sense. And, and I hear little sense nowadays. I wonder if I can provide any truth to that matter. I don't know. But I, I, I'm wondering about this. You know, uh, uh, how do we get out of this box? We're worried about getting out of the pandemic thing. How do we get out of this box? It may be more difficult than the pandemic, which we know less of than what we are talking about, the subject today. Uh, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure, sir. And I recommend a couple of your books that are right to the heart of where we are. And, and Dr. Heff, thank you for who you are. Thank you. Thanks for standing up.
because it's not easy. Don't, you know, tell me about it. God bless you. All right, thank you.